Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Association of Social Workers, Illinois Chapters, Google Hangout on the Floyd Mental Health Reporting System, What You Need to Know. I'm Joel Rubin, Executive Director of the NASW Illinois Chapter, and will be serving as this afternoon's moderator. The NASW Illinois Chapter is providing this training today to assist social workers around the state and understanding the new reporting system and its implications for practice. The NASW Illinois Chapter is the state's largest professional social work organization, helping social workers advance their careers, grow their business and practice, and protect the profession. For those of you who I invite you to join our association to help us continue to strengthen the voice of professional social work in the state of Illinois and around the country. Joining us this afternoon are Joe Monahan, JD ACSW, from the Monahan Law Group here in Chicago, and Laura Palazzolo and Craig Berberet from the Illinois Department of Human Services in Springfield. Our discussion this afternoon will be based on the many questions that participants sent us in advance of the Hangout, as well as live questions that you can post in the YouTube comments section. Any questions we won't get to today will be posted with answers on YouTube. And just a quick housekeeping note, today's event is free to participants. However, if you would like to receive one CEU for the workshop, the cost is $15 for non-members and free for NESW members. After the event, a link to, re to receive your CU will be displayed and will be listed on the YouTube description. So please follow the instructions in the link to earn your CU and allow 45 days for processing. All CEUs will be sent out to the email address in which you registered. Participants will have two weeks after live airing of today's event to redeem the CEU for the workshop. So, one of the first questions this afternoon is from Tim, and he asked, what is the law and how did it come about? So, Laura or Craig from um, the Illinois Department of Human Services, can you, can you address this, uh, this one? Thanks. Sure, it came from uh, Public Act 98-0063, which is commonly referred to the Concealed Carry Act. Uh, in our responses to the questions that we got from uh, Joel yesterday, it states that the legislation was in part in response to a decision made by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which was struck down. The result would have been Illinois would have become a concealed carry state by default without regulations or controls. So in the Concealed Carry Act, uh, there are a few uh, stipulations that say that uh, physicians, clinical psychologists, and qualified examiners must refer any individuals that are determined to be clear and present danger, develop me, develop me disabled, and intellectually disabled within a 24-hour period. You know, Joel, the, the uh, original uh, FOID Act was passed back in 1968, um, you know, and, and you can only think back about all the things that were going on in our country in 1968 and the violence that was there. Um, in 2008, uh, the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Confidentiality Act was amended. And, of course, that was another key moment in our, in our history in our country. If you recall, we had the Virginia Tech shootings, we had the, the shootings at Northern Illinois University. And the, the effect of these changes was really to expand the reporting requirements that were uh, designed for public hospitals and for mental health facilities. There was this nexus between uh, the use of guns and, unfortunately, mental illness. This newest act that was passed in 2013, effective last July 2013, was really designed to expand 
the reporting requirements for not only hospitals and mental health facilities, but it also took the amount of time uh, that was required to report and made it much shorter. So uh, the third thing that it did is expanded the requirements for uh, uh, reporting beyond just inpatient, but also to outpatient hospital settings. So uh, what we have here is um, in 2013, with the 2013 legislation, we have the legislature requiring the Department of Human and, uh, Services to um, uh, set up a system of online reporting requirements. And with that came the DHS policies, which I believe Craig and Laura are now responsible for. Great. Thanks. That was a, that was a great answer. Um, uh, the next one of our questions uh, relates to mandated reporting. And that question comes from uh, participants Maureen and Richard. And um, um, they are asking uh, the question of, are all social workers considered mandated reporters? And what practice settings are mandated? And furthermore, what other mental health professionals are required to report? Um, Joe, can you speak to this issue a little bit? Yes, I can. Um, clinical social workers are mandated reporters, and a clinical social worker, of course, is a social worker who has a master's or a doctoral degree from an accredited graduate uh, school of social work, has at least three years of supervised close uh, clinical social work practice, which includes such social work services as evaluation, treatment and prevention of mental health or emotional disorders. Um, the social worker who is mandated has to be licensed under the Clinical Social Work and Social Work Practice Act. What's interesting about this particular legislation and key to, for social workers to understand is that all practice settings are mandated. There are no practice uh, settings they're excluded from this law and other mental health practitioners are also required to report so you have uh, uh, clinical psychologists licensed clinical psychologists you have uh, licensed um, uh, physicians psychiatrists you have registered nurses who would meet the definition of a qualified examiner under the mental health code. You have marriage and family therapists um, and licensed clinical uh, um, counselors. So all of these people, as you can see, the intent of this law is to report. And they want to get as many mental health professionals who would have access to individuals who might meet the criteria of reporting to be re included in that. Great. Um, uh, Joe, related to this topic of mandated reporting, uh, we have a question from, uh, uh, from Kathleen and Michelle, uh, participants, is another, other participants who submitted questions. And their questions are, who must be reported? And is there an age limit on individuals reported? Interestingly, Joel, the um, first uh, question, or the second question I'll answer first, there is absolutely no age limit on reporting requirements. So um, it's an interesting part of the statute, which says uh, it, it does not have an age limit on there. So who must be reported? And this is, uh, there are two primary categories of individuals that must be uh, reported. First uh, is those individuals who are determined to be what the statute calls a clear and present danger to themselves or to others. So the first is a person who is a clear and present danger to themselves or others and um, maybe somewhat more uh, interesting or more controversial are those individuals who are determined to be developmentally disabled or determined to be 
intellectually disabled? And that might be a good question that we could throw to uh, Craig and Laura to talk about um, the, that requirement of reporting persons who are developmentally disabled. And then maybe I can come back and talk a little more about the definition of what clear and present danger is. That'd be great, thanks. You want to take it? Uh, if the person that is developmentally disabled is the qualified examiner, in this case a social worker that's qualified to report, is making the determination. So if the social worker sees a, a person with DD on a continually basis, they don't have to keep reporting this, this patient on a monthly or yearly basis or whenever they see them. Uh, normally there is a determination process that individuals go through to determine the patient as DD. So if they only make the determination that is when they have to report within that 24-hour time frame. One of the uh, interesting things about the law is um, if a person, say, is born with uh, uh, clearly a developmental disability, oftentimes we think about um, facial characteristics or some type of physical characteristic which would lead a physician to believe that a person is developmentally disabled. Um, that individual would have a clearly within that 24 hours an, op uh, an obligation to report that. Um, then subsequently, if there are going to be ongoing visits by uh, the person to professionals, the statute would suggest that each time there is a determination that the person has a developmental disability that they should be reported. Uh, my sense is that there is an emphasis on over-reporting in the statute and in the emergency rules passed by the department. Um, is that your sense, Craig and Laura? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be instances where duplicate reporting happens, but um, for right now, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of comb through that in, in changes, changing things, future releases to our programming, but for right now, we just want to make sure that every, everything is being reported. If it's a duplicate, it's not the worst thing that can happen. Um, the, the other thing, Joel, that you mentioned is this whole notion of what is clear and present danger. I think um, most mental health professionals have been uh, trained on issues of when a person is committable, when they are considered to meet the definition of a person who is subject to involuntary admission. But for purposes of this FOID reporting, clear and present danger means the person who communicates a serious threat of physical violence against a reasonably identifiable victim or poses a clear and imminent risk of serious physical injury to himself or herself or another. And it's determined by a qualified examiner that, um, that they, they're suicidal or assaultive threats, actions, or other types of behaviors. Clearly, this is going to be a person who meets the definition of clear and present danger and would be uh, required to be reported under the FOIA reporting statute. Great. Th thanks, Joe, because that was, a, that was a question that we had from a lot of participants, really, you know, what constitutes a clear and present danger. So that was really, really, really helpful. Um, so the other the, thing I would uh, mention about that, Joel, is it's really a clinical decision. That clinician has to determine whether or not the person meets the clear and present danger. It, although it's identified in the statute, as I mentioned, it's really that clinical interaction which is very important for the clinician to make. And then uh, that triggers, no pun intended, the reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the next set of questions um, uh, are directed to uh, Laura and Craig uh, at uh, IDHS, um, and um, the, uh, this question is, are, are clinicians required to ask a client or a patient if they own a gun? No. Um 
that's not necessary. It's just once that shouldn't have any involvement with the patient and their actual session, their meeting. Um, it's just if a determination is made, then it's reported to the department, and it's between us and state police to find out whether or not there's there's a risk if they have a gun if they're applying for a void card. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um. There's a couple of uh, uh, follow-up questions to that from a couple of our participants, and these are also for uh, Laura and Craig uh, in Springfield. Um, is um, uh, Sharon is asking, how do you actually complete the report? How does one obtain the required code and password? And then another participant uh, followed up on that and asked, what happens after a report is made? So um, if Lauren Craig, you can address those questions, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. On our, if you go to our homepage, the DHS Fully Reporting website, uh, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a link uh, called Qualified Examiner Registration. The Qualified Examiner can click on that, and the next page, you'll have to enter your first name, last name, uh, license number, your practice name, practice address, uh, any, any of your contact, any inf information. And after that, uh, DHS will verify if you're indeed an active licensee of the state of Illinois. At, after you, get, you receive your ID and password, you can uh, go back on and report a person. To report a person, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's just a link at the top of the page that will say report person. You just type in the last name, first name, date of birth, all of the address, geographical information, hair, color, weight, uh, all that good stuff. And then you just click uh, submit. After you click submit, we instantly receive that information. Then that night, we run our report. It's a batch report that runs every night against Illinois State Police's uh, current FOIA card holders and applicants. So if that's a match, if you, that person you report is a match, that'll show up the very next morning. So that's how uh, state police receives that information. So as a follow-up to that, um, uh, Craig, um, another one of our participants, Jacqueline, wants to know, um, is a report indefinite or does it last for a certain period of time? So the, the report is definitely, it's indefinite. Uh, if, if it's a clear and present danger or developmentally disabled report, it's in the system indefinitely. Now, the statute does say that the, uh, the person that has been reported can work with state police and the reporting clinician to remove their name from the system. But once it's in there, it's in there until it's removed by either state police or the reporter. Okay, great. Um, Joe, sort of related to this, um, who determines if a report is justified? And um, I think this is a very important question for, for our profession and for other professions, is that what recourse does a client or another person have if the social worker who's make, if the social worker who makes the report that, and the report is not justified? Well, it's interesting. Um, it's really, as I mentioned before, a clinical determination made by the clinician, the, you know, the qualified examiner, that social worker who says, yes, this person is a clear and present danger. Now, on the hospital side, obviously, once a person is admitted to the hospital, the hospital, too, has an obligation to report within seven days. So, um, some may disagree uh, that they are a clear and present danger, but it's the clinician's determination that the person represents a clear and present danger. So the, the practical question is what happens to this uh, report? Well, the individual or the Illinois Department of Human Services collects that data makes the, the list, so to speak, and that information is never disclosed, from my understanding, 
unless and until a person applies for a firearms identification or the person already has one and that match is made. So um, it's a clinical determination at, at, at the outset of whether or not a report should be made that the person is either a clear and present danger or it's determined to have an intellectual disability or developmental disability. And um, then that report would be made. That information stays in the DHS database unless and until there's a match made with the state police. And I guess we should confirm that with Greg and Lauren, yes? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we don't send over everybody that's reported, only persons that have a FOID card currently or is applying for a FOID card. That's correct. And that, that goes to another important point, that this is not information that's available to the public. It's not part of the public domain. It's not subject to the freedom of information requests. Um, it is solely for the purpose of uh, this matching with the state police. So uh, it is not uh, part of the public domain um, uh, under this program. Great. That, that, you know, that's really helpful because we had several questions from participants about that very thing of whether or not reported information uh, is in the public domain. And it sounds like from both of you, from Joe and uh, Craig's uh, answers, is that it's not until there, it's really needed to be in the public domain. So, so thanks for that clarification. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions that I want to actually direct to Joe. Uh, and um, uh, we have a participant, Nicole, that's asking um, uh, what discussion about the reporting system should take place with the client if a report is made? And does reporting violate confidentiality? And obviously, this is a very, very important question for, uh, for our profession and obviously for other professions as well. Joe? Well, let me, t let me take a whack at the first one. Um, you know, whether you discuss the, with your client uh, the fact that a report was made is going to be a clinical decision that the, the professional is going to have to make. Um, a lot of times what I encourage clients to do is discuss the limits of confidentiality at the start of the treatment relationship. So in your policies and your procedures, you may have policies and procedures which state uh, we have a confidential relationship. However, there are limits on that confidential relationship. For example, under child abuse, if there's child abuse, we will have to report that. For example, if there's elder abuse, we are required to report that. For example, if you represent a clear and present danger. So this might be an opportunity for clinicians, for social service agencies to really look at your policies and procedures to determine whether changes need to be made. And so just like when you have uh, are required to make a child abuse report, that's going to be a clinical decision on how you are going to explain that to the client. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's something that is going to be uh, necessary on a case-by-case -case basis to determine it might be something that you want to talk with legal counsel about. As to does this violate confidentiality? Well, indeed, this is an exception to, to the notion that your relationship is confidential. The Confidentiality Act was, uh, it was revised to permit this exception, and specifically, uh, Section 12B requires this reporting. So if you take a look at that, and we can talk more about that if you wanted to, but this is an exception to confidentiality, just like reporting of child abuse, just like reporting of elder abuse. And it's something that they want to indoctrinate and ingrain in our culture uh, so that uh, this reporting could be done. So sort of a corollary to that then, the reporting, does the reporting violate the NESW Code of Ethics? That's what one of our participants was asking. Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, the Code of Ethics, again, will 
talk about the importance and the value of confidentiality in the social work client relationship. However, the Code of Ethics will make exception for things such as uh, statutory mandated reporting, and that's what this would fall under. So this is not a violation of ethics. The, the rule of thumb that I use when, when advising clinicians on issues like this is it's on, as much information as necessary has to be communicated um, to make certain that you are meeting your duty. Um, and here we have a very limited amount of information that is necessary uh, to, in order to meet that duty. So it is not a violation of the ethics or of the statutory duty of confidentiality. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, Joe, another follow-up question is, so what happens in, and really what are the implications of not reporting a client or a patient? And um, are there any liability risks for social workers if they don't report? Um, the, the ramifications for not reporting are, you know, it, is, it goes with your whole duty of reporting. So your failure to report would be a breach. I mean, let's take the most extreme example. You have somebody who you have determined to be a clear and present danger. You say to yourself, I think I should report, but oh, I don't want to disrupt this clinical relationship with this individual. So you don't report. Sure enough, they go out, they get a, a firearms identification card, they go out and they purchase a, a, a gun, and they kill somebody. Your failure to report permitted that person, perhaps, to get a firearm identification, which permitted them to purchase a, um, a, uh, you know, a gun, and which led to that person killing somebody. So you have potential risk when you fail to do it. Typically when we see um, clinicians not do what they're supposed to do, like failing to report child abuse, failing to report elder abuse, failing to report under these firearms identification, it's usually tied with a more tragic outcome. And um, it could be part of the probable cause or the cause the nexus between what happened and the, fa the failure, the omission or commission by the social worker. So the short answer is report if you believe that there's a clear and present danger, report if you think uh, you have a duty to report. Um, there is associated with this immunity for reporting. Good faith immunity is assumed when you report. And the failure to report also is immune if you make a good faith. If you document, if you believe in your clinical circumstance that it was not necessary to do, and you can document that, then I think you'll be okay. But it's, it's always document what your thoughts are because your record is going to be the best friend in case there's some problem um, down the road. You know, uh, I know we don't have a you know all afternoon on our on our broadcast today, but there's all kinds of scenarios where, jumping off from what you just responded, and I mean, you know, we get calls of people who clinicians who are working in a rural part of the state, and um, you know, uh, somehow maybe they make a report, and the, the you know the person that they've been reporting on sort of knows pre puts you know connects the dots. And uh, says, oh, they, they must have reported me. I, sometimes the, the question comes, of, is it a safety issue? Do I report? I'm just trying to throw in some more scenarios here because I think sometimes it's, it's really challenging for, for clinicians in, in these kinds of situations. These are, they can be difficult uh, situations, Joel, I agree with you. Um, the issue is um, if a clinician believes that there's a clear and present danger, they should report. And uh, th that the idea, the, the whole premise behind this law is to have some accountability uh, when a person wants to get a firearm identification card. And uh, because of the tragedies, 
and you can go back, as I said, to 1968 and the amendments all the way up through last year. These amendments are always in response to, it seems to me, the tragedies that have happened. The Columbines, the Virginia Tech, the Northern Illinois University, these tragic instances where people with guns are wreaking havoc um, on innocent individuals. And so I think it's, it's the legislature's response to try to have some kind of control over who's getting firearms identification. For mental health professionals, it's a challenge because we know that people with diagnosed mental illness are no more likely to commit crimes than other individuals. But unfortunately, these national tragedies lead to this kind of legislation. And I think as professionals, social workers and other qualified examiners have to enforce the duties that they have and make the reporting. And the other, the one thing I will underline once more is that this is a report to the Department of Human Services. And the Department of Human Services shares that information with the police. When the police say, hey, John Smith or Mary Smith or John Jones has applied for a firearm identification, do you have data? That's when the match is made. It's not indiscriminate, it's not uh, shared, uh, except when somebody makes that application or has the firearm identification card. I would be interested to hear from uh, you know, uh, Craig and Laura about how the response has been, particularly uh, since last July, with uh, how is it going at the department as far as uh, hospitals reporting and clinicians reporting? Are you keeping any data on that yet? Um, it's going pretty well. It was kind of a, a rough start in January, and then once we did some updates to our system in, in uh, April, but those have mostly been uh, technical errors, uh, things with our system and other other facility systems trying to match up and submit information. Uh, individual clinicians have all been reporting. You know, they seem to, it's gone a lot better than we thought it was going to. Has there been any instance of anybody making specific complaints about being reported or un the unfairness of the system that you're aware of? As far as patients go, yes. Uh, the only time is when we have somebody reported an error, which has happened. If um, a certain floor at a facility is overbooked, so they're set on a psychiatric unit just for a short period of time, and they're reported an error. That's happened several times, uh, more more often than you would think. So, and then they get notification about their FOID card being revoked, and it's kind of you know frustrating for them, but we work with everybody, ISP in the facility to get it taken care of as quickly as possible. Um, as far as anybody else that is reported and it is a legitimate report, uh, they seem to understand that. People seem to understand that concern. So, we had any so interestingly, if a person like a uh, police officer is admitted to a psychiatric unit, um, what is the impact of them and their ability to carry a firearm if uh, a police officer is admitted in Illinois now? It's our understanding it would be just the same as anybody else. It gets yeah. run through the system because they have to have a FOID card. And so the consequence of that, and, and indeed I, I had a case, uh, in, you know, not under this recent thing, but a couple of years ago, where a police officer who was in need of uh, psychiatric treatment uh, admitted himself as a voluntary patient to a psychiatric facility and consequently lost his firearm identification uh, uh, card. He sued the, the psychiatric facility for reporting and um, I had the job of defending that. And it was, a, it, was a, it was an interesting case in that uh, for the hospital, it was non-discretionary. Uh, the, the hospital was mandated to
to make that report. The consequence was that the police officer lost his ability to carry a firearm, but his remedy, and the remedy of anyone who's reported, frankly, is that there's a process through the Illinois State Police to show cause why they should be able to get a firearm. And I understand they're having those hearings. Is that your understanding? Yeah, the, the state police actually has a few different forms of appeals process. So depending on what type of report was made on a patient, for instance, either a clear and present danger, development disabled, or an adjudicated or non-adjudicated admission to a psychiatric unit, uh, the person may appeal through the state police and ultimately it's up to the state police director to allow that person to receive a third part of it. Yep. In another area where there was a change in this, uh, the, the most recent amendment, uh, Joel, was the uh, fact that once you were adjudicated a disabled person in the probate court, meaning you have had a guardian appointed for you, the circuit court of the, of the local courthouse has to also report that person. So ironically, when we have uh, individuals who have guardians appointed for them, the notice of that appointment has to be sent to DHS as well. And I'm sure uh, Laura and Craig are getting those uh, from the, the courts as people are being adjudicated. Wow. Um, well, that's Joe, those are really um, excellent examples uh, from your practice as well. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a little bit of time we have uh, remaining before we get to uh, some of our live questions, but I want to um, ask a couple more questions that have come in for, from participants that are a little bit more nuanced. Um, as well, and then uh, about ten minutes before the hour, we'll go to some uh, we'll go to some live questions. Um, another question from one of our per, uh, participants, uh, Valerie, notes uh, saying that the the system includes reporting individuals that have been diagnosed with a cognitive or developmental disability. <clears throat> Valerie asks, does the law apply to cases in which young children, as young as two years old, are diagnosed with these conditions? Um, I, I think that's one of the areas that I think uh, um, Laura may have mentioned that the, the, the state is going to look at those. Um, if you read the black and white of the law, it says each time you determine that a person has an intellectual disability, you're to report that. And so we could have a circumstance upon birth, upon examination, upon a well-being check, uh, you know, each and every time that individual would see a clinician, that that clinician would have an obligation to report. So I think that's one of the areas where um, my clients who have, uh, you know, a, a large number of patients that they're seeing who are considered to be uh, with a diagnosis of intellectual or de developmental disability, they are going to have to figure out how to report that. And I think that's one area where we need. But a black and white letter reading of the law would suggest if you determine that a person has an intellectual or developmental disability, you have an obligation to report. Um, the state is fully aware of that, and uh, I think that they're going to, uh, I would expect there to be some changes in that going forward. Laura, Craig, you want to add anything to that? No, I think Joe did a great job. Okay. Mission must report any time there's a, a determination. So I think you did a great job explaining that. And then again, that goes back to if, if, if a patient thinks that that determination was unjust, if it was something from they were, when they were a child, there is that appeals process with the state police, so they do have an opportunity to appeal it. You know, that was an interesting part of the, um, of the law as well, Joel, that we talked about earlier, the notion that there is not a, an age restriction. And so I thought, boy, why would we have a, you know, a need to report children? And uh, what I learned in, in further 
discussion of this issue was that uh, oftentimes uh, there are people who are younger who may hunt or who have guns uh, in, and, uh, you know, uh, their family outings with guns, whether they be target practice or whatever, that the younger children would be looking for firearms identification, even to the point of very young children, um, which also gives rights for uh, individuals to, to get more guns in, in, in essence. An interesting point. Um, it's another question from uh, another participant. Uh, Nicole asks, is it necessary to make a report if someone agrees to a safety plan? So, for example, someone with suicidal thoughts with no intent to act. No, that's, that's why uh, clinicians have a very difficult duty of, of trying to figure out, is this a, 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 is this a clear and present danger, is this immediate danger, is this imminent danger, all of those terms that we use. And the bottom line is that the clinician's going to have to use her or his best clinical judgment in determining whether or not this is a reportable event. The fact, if you've made that determination that they meet the standard that we talked about initially, then you report. And the fact that they have a safety plan does not, I mean, this is not a negotiation usually that you'll have with the client. So I think uh, understand what your duty is to report and make the report, particularly if you believe that that person's a clear and present danger. The fact that they agree to a, a, a safety plan, in my view, would not be sufficient to discharge your duty. Um, we have a question that uh, sort of is uh, regarding uh, social workers' work in the school setting, and this comes from Ann. Um, and Ann asks, "What are the requirements for working in a school setting with an L with an LCSW? If a student, for example, for, if a student is hospitalized for homicidal ideation, does a report need to be made?" I think once again, if you are a, a clinical social worker at LCSW, it doesn't matter what setting you're in, whether you're in a police setting, you're in uh, a school setting, a hospital setting, uh, a community-based mental health uh, in a private practice, wherever you are. If you make that determination that the person is a clear and present danger, you report. Taking your example, uh, Joel, and saying, okay, so you made the determination that this uh, student had homicidal ideation. You took the steps as a school social worker to get that person hospitalized. And this is a good example of how um, the statute is getting ready to over-report. So we would have that social worker make a report upon admission to the hospital or within seven days of the admission of the hospital, the hospital would have an obligation to report. If that student made that statement about homicidal ideation to someone in the hospital who was a qualified examiner, they would have an obligation to report. And if they made it to somebody else within the hospital, they would have an obligation to report. And so in that one instance, you might have three, four, or five reports in, in, in a seven-day period. The emphasis is on reporting, and the state is aware that there may be some over-reporting. But once that match is made, if that person then goes and re requests a firearm identification card, that match will be made, and then there will be further investigation done. So that's how it would work in practice. Great, thanks. Um, uh, there's another question. This is regarding. This is from a from a from Jerry who uh, works in a who is a police-based social worker. The question is, what needs to be reported? For example, does domestic violence, those at mental health positions. And at what capacity should those reports be made? And may, many people know that you know there, there are so many social workers that work, uh, whether directly in a police department or work with police with police uh, departments around the state. 
Um, once again, the, the, the answer is clear and present danger. Does that person, uh, have they made a threat against a reasonably identifiable uh, victim or do they pose a clear and imminent risk of some uh, physical injury to themselves or others? And um, again, it does not matter what setting you're in. The idea is to report. Um, and so the police officers or the police social workers who really are in the streets and have access to all sorts of circumstances, um, they too would have all of the mandates of reporting if they're licensed clinical social workers or meet the definition of a qualified examiner under the mental health code. I don't know if Laura or uh, Craig had anything to add to that, but um, that's my interpretation. No, I don't have anything to add, Joe. Okay, um, well, we're at a point in time in our broadcast today where we actually, um, uh, we're going to take some questions from, uh, some live questions, people who are, are watching, uh, watching the uh, panel this afternoon. And we have a question from Judith, and Judith asked, um, I'm an LCSW. My supervisees are LSWs and other professionals. If they report an individual to me as a, quote, clear and present danger, quote, unquote, am I obligated to report what was told to me? Um, I think you're mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a supervision type, type question. Uh, what do you think, Craig and Laura? Go ahead. You want me to? Go? You want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, your obligation is to report only persons that you personally make the determination of. So whoever is making that determination should make the report. If you haven't seen the patient, you don't have the obligation to make the report. Joe, you want to add anything to that? Uh, you know, I, I might, I might have a little bit of a disagreement there, um, in the sense that uh, if, if you, it, it, Joel, as you aptly described, as a supervisor, there's some respondeat superior, meaning you are responsible for the activities of the people that you supervise, and. Um, there are certain things that uh, I think that if subordinates are doing that, maybe as a supervisor, you might have to go back and um, and and do a more thorough investigation. I would I would find it very difficult to defend a supervisor who says I didn't do something because I didn't directly hear or see or smell or uh, you know interact with that individual. So I would I would want to be a little more clear on that before I said um, that they didn't have the obligation. The LCSW didn't have the obligation to um, make that report of a clear and present danger. Um, I would suggest that that would be something that they would want to talk to their uh, lawyers about um, before making a determination. Um, I would, uh, you know, uh, give it to the, you know, if we, if we use the analogy of, of child abuse, anyone who has, uh, uh, is a mandated reporter under child abuse, it's that individual's um, responsibility to report. And their failure to report provides a lot uh, 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 failure to report provides a lot of problems for people. Now in this instance, an argument could be made that they don't have the obligation. It's not a broad as uh, obligation under the child abuse or elder abuse reporting. But I would want to take a look at the individual circumstances before I'd say, um, as a general proposition that supervisors don't have the obligation to report. We would require the person to make, to make the determination to report, and yeah, whatever specific rules or guidelines you have within your organization, you'd obviously need to follow those, you know, with your supervisor and your legal counsel for your organization. But to the department, it's the person that makes the determination. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I think that's a good distinction to make. Great. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, everyone. 
Um, a question from Richard, uh, another live question, and Richard asks, can you clarify the definition of an intellectual disability? Does it cover individuals with dementia? And if so, at what stage of the illness must the report be made? And this is very important for a lot of our social workers, obviously, who work uh, with older adults. Ready to go? Um, our definition of intellectually disabled is significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning which exists concurrently with impairment and adaptive behavior in which originates before the age of 18 years. Um, we try to stay out of a specific diagnosis. You know, we just go by just general guidelines, and then that's really more, again, your clinical judgment as to what specific diagnosis we can't make that call. Joe? Um, yeah, the, the definition that's in the actual um, statute for developmental disability means a, a disability, and this is the, the quote from it, which is attributable to any other condition which results in impairment similar to that caused by an intellectual disability and which requires services similar to those required by intellectually disabled persons. The disability must originate before the age of 18 and be expected to continue indefinitely and constitute a substantial handicap. So that's the definition of a developmental disability. It takes the uh, federal definition, which um, is used, in, for example, in determining whether someone is disabled for Social Security purposes, to have an onset before the age of 18. Um, and uh, so that also takes away that whole notion of if you're looking at developmental disability, whether or not it is, it, you know, for somebody who is um, uh, considered to have uh, dementia. But when you talk about intellectual disability, as they said, the um, definition that Laura just uh, uh, read to you is something that you should consider and when making uh, the report or not making the report. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, this is the next live uh, question is from Lee, and this is probably direct, uh, probably directed to Craig and Laura. Um, is there a way to know if a client has already been added to the list for FOID reporting? No, uh, our users can only search on persons they've reported in the past. So there's no way to search on any person to see if they've been reported or not. Uh, again, if you if you make that determination, you're required to report no matter if they've been reported or not. So. Okay, yeah, and I think that's consistent with what we talked about before, that whole notion of there is going to be over-reporting. And uh, so your obligation is not, has this been done before? Your obligation is to report if you believe that a person is a clear and present danger. Right, and if there's an inquiry on, on a person and it comes up with multiple reports around, you know, within a few days of each other, it's probably the same incident. We just send all that data to state police and that's for their review. Great, thank you, that was very helpful. Um, <clears throat> one uh, one additional live question. Uh, this comes from Lynn, and Lynn's question is regarding the confidentiality of reporters. Is it possible that when an applicant for FOIA is turned down, it will be able to find out who reported them as being a clear and present danger? If so, doesn't that potentially put the reporter at significant risk? And that was actually sort of the I had actually alluded to that a little bit earlier in the in the broadcast today as well. Um, there's no way, I mean, we, we protect that information. We would never release that. Um, if there's the, if you're the only person that has reported them or that they've seen, then obviously they can figure that out. And I mean, unfortunately we don't really have a solution to that, to that. It, it's nothing that we can do. 
Okay. Joe, would you like to add anything to, to that uh, you know, question? It, it is always a challenge for, for um, clinicians when, when they're put into this position of being, instead of helper, being reporter. And it, it gives rise to, you know, clinical issues that they have to address, you know. Um, and again, I would make the analogy to child abuse. If I report this person as being a child abuser, it's going to interfere with my professional therapeutic relationship. And you're absolutely correct. And if I report this person because I suspect that they're engaging in elder abuse, it's going to impact your therapeutic relationship. You're absolutely correct. If you report that a person is being a clear and present danger, or if you take steps to have someone committed because you believe that they're subject to involuntary admission, it does put you into a particular, it could put you into a particular uh, uncomfortable position. Um, right before I came over here, I was talking with this, a social worker who said, I, I received a call from somebody who said that this person was going to kill me and take me out with a bunch of other people. And this therapist was absolutely terrified, rightly so. Now, what are, what are the steps that one can do? Well, um, the, the reporter of this had reported to you know, DHS, that the person was a clear and present danger. What else could they do? Well, they initiated commitment, and yes, the person was in the hospital. And how else do you discharge your duty to warn? Well, they reported it to the police. They reported it to, uh, you know, they took steps, and this person was in the hospital. And so now the, the, says, the person says, well, what happens when they come out? And my hope is that before this person gets out, they get the treatment that they need and they will no longer be dangerous and that the hospital won't let them out if they are dangerous. But there are steps then that the person would have to take at their office and, and uh, in, in terminating the, uh, the relationship they have with that person and other clinical steps. So like so many things, uh, what we always say, Joel, is get consultation get clinical consultation, and get legal consultation to address these very, very difficult issues that, you know, social workers have to address, unfortunately, all too often. Thanks, Joe. Um, we are uh, coming uh, to the end of our broadcast this afternoon, and I would just would like to briefly ask in the next minute or two for uh, uh, any of our panelists, if they would have any closing remarks, uh, comments about resources uh, before we sign off today. Craig and Laura? If, uh, any of the qualified examiners listening today, they can go to our website. We have all types of information on there. Uh, on the left-hand top uh, tab, there's a who reports, and that'll explain who is required to report. Uh, next to that is a tab called uh, what to report. That explains the type of information that uh, the required reporter is required to report, obviously. Uh, other information or frequently asked questions. We also have some special use cases on there. We have a training video. We have a couple of training PowerPoints to, if you want to look through. Uh, we also have a contact us link on there. If you want to shoot DHS an email, uh, we can uh, at least try to respond to every email that we get. And if we, Laura and I can't answer those emails ourselves, we'll send them on to the uh, FOID steering community to get answered. So there's plenty of information on that website. Great. Um, Joe? Joe, I understand that as part of this uh, uh, Google chat that NASW is going to put together links to uh, the DHS web page as well as an article that I wrote uh, previously about this and try to demystify. Really, that's what, that's, there's so many uh, misunderstandings uh, out there in the field because people don't understand what their obligations are. And hopefully uh, through this uh, our webinar today, or our Google chat, that people now understand who who has to report, what they have to report, and the process for reporting. Uh, 
And the other thing I think that was important to, to realize is that these are reports that are going to the Department of Human Services and that they're not shared with anybody other than the state police. And that's only when the person has a, a, a firearms identification card or they're applying for one. So this is not available to the public. And I think those are common misunderstandings that I see in the questions that people ask us about this. And finally, I would say thank you for the state uh, for participating in this, the Department of Human Services, clearing up a lot of these questions. And thanks to NASW for uh, making this available to so many people. Great. Sure, we're well, glad we could help. Great. Well, uh, I want to thank I want to thank all all our panelists on behalf of the NASW Illinois chapter. Uh, they were really excellent. Joe Monahan from the Monahan Law Group, Law, <clears throat> Laura Palazzolo and Greg Berberet from the Illinois Department of Human Services. They were great. Uh, and to all of our viewers, thank you for participating in today's Google Hangout. Today's presentation has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube. And thank you for participating.